Hi, my name is Michaela Orsini, and today is January 7th, 2012, and I'm interviewing Dante Orsini about his experiences in the war. So, how now, old are you? I'm known as Dan. <laughs> Your father and others are known as Dante, okay? Mm -hmm. I've been known as Dan for 70 years. Alright? Alright. Just so you know. Dan. Uh, how old are you? 91. How old were you when you went in the service? I was, I enlisted in 1940, so, and that was May 4th, 1940, so that was before my 20th birthday, so I was 19 when I went into the service. Did you get drafted? No, no draft then. Hmm. This was pre-war. Pre this was a good two years before Pearl Harbor. Um, what were you trained to do at boot camp? Hmm? What were you trained to do at boot camp? What was I trying to do where? What were you trained to do at boot camp? What was I trained to do? Mm -hmm. Well, anybody, anybody who enters the military is trained to do things. Uh, it depends on which service you're going in and which facility you're at, what your specialties are, and you, they give you a series of tests to determine what you're best suited for. So the first thing they do is give you a, a training of 6 to 10 to 12 weeks, which they gave me at Paris Island, South Carolina. And uh, it, it, I was in the Marines, which is tough. And that was pre-war, which is twice as tough. Because there was no war, but they wanted to make sure that we were well trained. And that's what the Marines were all about. So uh, I had no specialty at that time. So what happened was... After the training, after 11 weeks of training, they called me into an office and they said, we see, according to your papers, that you graduated from high school. And they asked me where I graduated from, and I told them, St. Mary's Academy in Glens Falls, and took a postgraduate course at South Glens Falls. And while I was at South High, I took two business courses, two of the greatest decisions I ever made in my life. One of them was, I took typing. So when this guy interviewed me at Paris Island, he said, I see according to your papers that you know how to type. He said, we don't have too many Marines who know how to type. We're sending you to Washington, D.C. That was the opening of my life. I said, what the hell am I going to do in Washington, D.C.? You know? So they sent me to Washington, D.C. And what happened there? <clears throat> I, was, I was assigned to the... I was assigned to the Marine Corps Institute, which is a correspondence school for naval personnel. <clears throat> and uh, immediately I became what they call the detachment clerk. That's the guy that got all the papers from 150 different people, put them all together, typing this and typing that. Don't forget, this is all BC stuff, before computers. You did everything by letter, by telephone, and things like that. So it took time to do what we had to do. So we used a lot of mail, a lot of telephoning. And my job was to uh, help the commanding officers run our correspondence school. While I was there, they told me that I was, be I was going to become a member of the White House Guard. And that flattered me to think that they would choose me. I had only been in Washington, D.C. three months. Already I'm a member of the White House Guard, which is quite a thing. The White House Guard is made up of 60 guys, 20, 20, 20, each with week-long duties. And our job was to be near or protect the President of the United States and go wherever he went, wherever they demanded that we go. <clears throat> so I had the opportunity to see many, many things that the normal person in life would not see. I'm one of the guys who saw FDR swimming in his pool. Nobody saw that. I knew that FDR was disabled, couldn't walk, he had polio, he had to be lifted out of his chair, he had to be wheelchaired to wherever he went, you know, things like that. So, and I went to many events with the president, on several occasions, uh, he, I, he went to I went to 
Morris Springs, Georgia twice with his train. That was in a little White House in Georgia. That's where he died in 1945. But uh, I had an opportunity to go down there and shook hands with him down there. And uh, uh, that was very thrilling, seeing the president in his car going by and saying, Hello, Sergeant, how are you this morning? You know, that kind of thing. Um, what was your name? Um, where were you on December 7th, 1941? Okay. I was in Washington, D.C. I was playing basketball at the U.S. Naval Hospital, <coughs> at the newest naval facility in Washington, D.C. It was about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and <coughs> they stopped the ball game, and they said, uh, we want you to know that we just found out that uh, Pearl Harbor has been bombed. Well, okay. Uh, it was no big deal then. So we finished our ball game <laughs> because we weren't sure, you know, we weren't sure how serious this was. We found out later it was. So when I got back to the barracks that night, this was still December the 7th, and my name was on a bulletin board, and it said, U-20 uh, will be at the House of Representatives tomorrow night. The president is going to address the nation. December the 8th. <clears throat> That's when President Roosevelt gave his famous uh, Day of Infamy speech. It still goes on record as one of the greatest speeches ever given by a president. He knew he had a job to do. He had to bring the country together to win the war. And how do you do it? Well, he told us how we did it. He gave us, he gave that speech. I was about maybe 100, 200 feet to his right in the House of Representatives when he spoke. And uh, it was very inspiring and he had everybody, he showed his leadership abilities then as president. Politics went out the window. All of a sudden he's the commander in chief. He brought everybody together. And it's the same thing as saying, hey guys, we got a war, we got to win. What are we going to do? So that's that was that day of infamy speech. That was December the 8th. And then from then on, the world changed. Uh, that's when America loaded its gun and decided, hey, we got to, this is serious. The Japanese have attacked us. Uh, they destroyed our fleet. It was a great victory for them. Now it was our turn. We had to build our country up. And uh, that's where we started. So when did you go overseas? <clears throat> a lot of things happened before I went overseas. I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> I'm still in Washington, D.C. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 1942, uh, from my second trip to Warren Springs, Georgia, uh, I attended the uh, dedication of the Jefferson Memorial. That's where the president laid the cornerstone. He dedicated the Jefferson Memorial in 1943. And I was one of the 20 Marines who was with the President when he did that. Very inspiring. Must have been 50,000 people there that day. Second time uh, I was with the President was when, don't forget now, uh, we're talking uh, 1941 because we're still talking about he had just been re-elected for the fourth time, okay? Mm -hmm. So his inauguration hadn't even taken place yet. <clears throat> so on the 29th of January, 1941, President Roosevelt was inaugurated as president for the fourth time. There was an inaugural, an inaugural day parade, which I was in, uh, I was invited with the 20 Marines to go to the inaugural ball, which took place at the Mayflower Hotel, probably five or 10,000 people, and uh, that was the night that I sat at the same table with Mickey Rooney, Eva Gardner, Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, and three or four other people, okay? That was a very exciting night. The President got inaugurated, I was in the same ballroom when that happened. So these are the exciting things before I went overseas. <clears throat> a lot of other things happened 
in Washington, D.C. too, but they're too numerous to mention. Now, if you're asking me about going overseas, mm -hmm. <clears throat> i got to tell you a little aside here first. I was, I was in 19, early 1943, they promoted me to Sergeant Major. Might not mean much to most people. Sergeant Major is the highest enlisted rank in the Marine Corps. Never been a, attained by guys that have been in the service for 12, 15 years. For three years I was in. They made me a Sergeant Major and I said, how come you're making me a Sergeant Major? I'm just a kid. Well, you earned it. They said, you're, you happen to be the youngest Sergeant Major ever in the Marine Corps. Take that to the bank. I never looked, that's, that was the truth. And uh, so I had to live up to a certain, you know, uh, level. Uh, so I'm a Sergeant Major, <coughs> I'm a Sergeant Major in 1943. <coughs> I requested, they said, hey, I've been in D.C. here now two years, the war is two years old, it's time for me to go overseas. <coughs> I said, where do I sign? They said, Sergeant Major, you have to do one thing first before you're going to go overseas. <coughs> What's that? We want you to go to Quantico <coughs> to become an officer, get your commission first, become a platoon leader, and then go overseas. <coughs> I said, well, I really don't want to do that, but if that's the only way you're going to get me out of Washington, I'll do it. Eighteen weeks later, in Quantico, Virginia, I earned my commission up there. Signed by Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox. That's about the uh, 12th, of, 12th of January. As a matter of fact, 1944. That would be 68 years. What? Another another few days. Right. Yeah. Anyway, and I was happy until the very next day when I got my orders. It said, Lieutenant Orsini, congratulations. Your orders have been changed. I didn't like that. My order said he will remain at Quantico as a machine gun instructor. Broke my heart. I didn't want any part of being a machine gun instructor. I was told that once I got my commission, I would go overseas. Now it's through 16 weeks to hell. So I got to be known that I didn't like it and I was going not going to accept my orders. They said, well, you got no choice. We're going to give you a general court martial or you have to resign your commission and we'll make you a sergeant major again. I'll resign my commission. What do I sign? So 15 minutes later, I resign my commission. I'm a sergeant major. Three days later, I'm on a train to the West Coast. So I'm an enlisted man again. I'm a sergeant major, and I'm on my way overseas. I had to stop at California for six weeks first. Okay? When I got to, uh, when I got to California, Camp Pendleton, California, I had the opportunity the very next Sunday, which was Easter Sunday, to see something awesome. The uh, Easter sunrise services at the Bowl, the Hollywood Bowl, the mountain. You see that sign in Hollywood up there? Mm -hmm. I saw that, that. I was up close to it. Took photos of that, you know. 25,000 Marines were there that morning at the sunrise service. Very, very, very nice. And from there, the next morning, we were told that, well, we have one more day in California, Los Angeles, California, and we're going to let you guys do what you want. We recommend that you go to the state court canteen. Didn't know what the hell that was. So we had one night out. <coughs> state door canteen. That's where I met Betty Davis. I don't know if you remember her or not. Mm -hmm. Betty Davis. Uh, Betty Rabel. Uh, that lady that acted with uh, Bogart there. What was her name? Uh, not, not Red Grave. Oh, oh, anyway, that famous actress there. Uh, but anyway, that that was uh, that night. Uh, they they picked me out of a crowd because I had all the stripes. They said, we're going to dress you as a lady with boobs and we're going to dress Betty Davis as Groucho Marx, which they did. So I have photos in there of all that. And uh, so that took care of the state door canteen night. The next night, we boarded a ship 
in Los Angeles, in San Diego, and we were on our way overseas. Now that was early 1945. Okay? That was the beginning of my duties overseas. <coughs> uh, in uh, May, <coughs> uh, April, April or May of 1945, I was on the invasion and the recapture of the island of Guam. People don't realize how big an island that is. A beautiful island. The Japanese had taken it from us way back in 44. We recaptured it at a high price. We killed maybe 30,000 Japanese, but they killed 5,500 Marines. That was a high total to pay to get, to get the island back. We needed that island for the B-29s. It wasn't quite everything we needed. We got Guam back. Three months later, same thing happened on the island of Okinawa. We had to have Okinawa to get these big planes to, if we were going to invade Japan. And we needed that extra 1,000 miles. So, I was in on the invasion of Okinawa. That was a fierce battle. Once again, we killed a lot of Japanese people and uh, they killed several thousand Marines once again. There was a, a naval battle going off, going on offshore and a land battle between the Marines, the Army, and Japanese forces. We took that at a high cost. We had to have the island back. So that took care of Okinawa. Those are the two major campaigns I was part of. I killed Japanese myself. I was fortunate in both uh, island campaigns. I didn't get hit. I didn't get hurt. I had hell scared out of me a couple of times. And uh, it just so happens that one of the Japanese officers that I killed had a, had a saber on him. I took that and brought that home. My daughter Janice got that up in her, up in her house. <clears throat> I took the Japanese flag that the officer had and I brought that home. So I have memorabilia of the things that I did while I was overseas. And only because I was a sergeant major was I allowed to bring this stuff back home. The normal guy couldn't bring it home. But those seven stripes that I had made a lot of difference and gave me some authority. Am I in key here? Okay. So that was the end of uh, Guam and Okinawa. In the meantime, being on Okinawa, you can see all these ships out there at sea. Must have been thousands of them out there. You couldn't count them, but you knew something big was going on. And what it was was, the plan was to invade Japan as soon as possible, which meant hundreds of thousands of troops, thousands of ships, thousands of airplanes, to get ready, we're going to hit Japan. That's what we all thought until Truman made the decision to drop the two atomic weapons. As far as I'm concerned, he made the best decision any man living dead or alive could ever make. He saved millions of lives on both sides. Now, the two bombs that were dropped, there's a little story attached to that, and it's so important. <coughs> USS Indianapolis is a heavy cruiser in the United States Navy. They loaded the Indianapolis with those two atomic weapons in San Diego and three weeks later that ship came to the Tinian Islands, dropped off the two weapons that were going to be loaded and took off. When that ship took off from Tinian, halfway to the Philippines, it was torpedoed. The ship went to the bottom 800 personnel got killed immediately. 150 were in the water for seven days until some observer plane saw something in the water didn't know what it was. They went down there and they, they two days later they rescued about 150 guys. Half of them some missing arms and legs and eaten by sharks. And uh, my, I always tell everybody that's my what if story of the war. What if that ship had been sunk 
on the way to Tinian, everything would have been on the bottom of the ocean. The two bombs would not have been dropped. The war would have lengthened by two more years. We didn't have any other atomic weapons. So that's my what if story of the war. Okay? Now, while I'm on Okinawa, we had to have uh, one more mission. And they, they called me in and they said, Sergeant Major, you and 18 other Marines are going to go on a mission. I, I'm on Okinawa. I said, what, what kind of a mission are we going on? Can't tell you right now. That letter up there tells you right there. What happened was they put us into a Higgins boat, which is a, I don't know if you know what a Higgins boat is, it carries about 50, 60 people one night. And we climbed on board. Then they told us, you're going to go to uh, an island that we call Rota, R O T A. And the purpose of the mission to Rota is to determine if any heavy aircraft can land there. They needed that extra airfield. Well, to make a long story short, we went, killed a few Japanese, uh, and my platoon leader, the guy that was in charge, was killed. We brought him back. He was the only one killed. And uh, uh, we determined that the airfield, was, uh, that a rota was not big enough for airplanes that size. That was the end of that. But that was my special mission. I got a letter from the general on that. Okay. The atomic bombs ended the war. They signed the peace treaty on board the USS Missouri. I have a copy of the original document that Douglas MacArthur, Hirohito, Chester Nimitz signed. I don't know if you remember that photo. Yep, I do. Yeah, okay. Uh, after the uh, war, they called the 1st Marine Division. Uh, President Truman said the 1st Marine Division will proceed to China, Peking, China, now known as Beijing. And the purpose was to, the Chinese were having trouble, communists and uh, nationalists, and our job was to get in between them, separate them, so there wouldn't be another war that we had to go to. And we were, I was there eight months in China at the American Embassy. I was a sergeant major in charge of all Marines at the American Embassy. And we had 25,000 Marines in China. Now, at one point, one morning, they called me in. They said, Sergeant Major, you assemble your troops. We're going to go to Tiananmen Square. Now, I know you read sometimes about Tiananmen Square. Huge facility. Uh, it's a big field. A mile that direction, and another mile that way. Nothing in between. It was meant for troop formations. So we gathered the troops there. Chiang Kai-shek was there. And uh, before I know it, they come to me and they said, Sergeant, will you join those, those troops up there? And there were nine guys standing it up front. And I was a tent. And as we were standing there, Chiang Kai-shek's coming along. And he decorated each one of the Marines, including myself. And But we had to give these decorations back. They called it the Order of the Cloud and Banner. According to a custom, their custom, not allowed to take these back to the United States. Okay. So that was my big deal with Chiang Kai-shek. Six weeks later, they tell us that we're going home. That not they, we. Our, our battalion was with Some of the Chinese, some of the Marines stayed my platoon, my battalion was ordered home. So a few weeks later, uh, I came to Bainbridge, Maryland, and I was discharged on uh, February 1946. That ended my career there, okay? Now, I want to back up one, one more thing. Back in 1941, this was December, this was December the 24th, Christmas Eve, 1941. Winston Churchill had come to, to the United States to talk about the war and how, what they were going to do, Britain and the United States, how they were going to join forces to combat uh, Japan. The big thing Christmas Eve was this lighting of the Christmas tree for the nation. 
and FDR says, we'll light that tree. Mr. Churchill and I will push the button, but it will be the last time that that tree will be lit until after the, <clears throat> until after the war. And that's what happened. So, I was pleased because I'm standing there, 18 of us, near the south portico of the White House, full dress, Marine uniform, and they wheeled the president uh, past us. And as President Roosevelt was going by me, he looked at me, Hi, Sergeant, how are you? He remembered me from uh, Warren Springs, Georgia. Shook hands with the president. Right behind him, Winston Churchill. Oh, how are you, Sergeant? So I shook hands with the two world leaders in 30 seconds on December the 24th, 1941. Big day in my life. I wanted to back up and make sure you got that recorded. No, I got it. No. Where are we? Uh, so what did you do after you returned home? After the war? Mm -hmm. Post-war talking about. Okay. Yep. Number one, I got married. Married my wife, Hazel. We've been married now for how long we've been married, Hazel? Sixty-seven years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I came home and I got a job at Scott Paper Company in Fort Edward. Because of my military record, they give me a pretty good job, a lot of authority, and once again, this is BC, before computers, before the damned uh, cell phones and everything else that you guys got now. All we did was, they put me in charge of all the IBM machines at the plant. I was in charge of the payroll. Now, you got to envision this. 675 employees worked at Scott Paper in Fort Edward, which is now Irving Tissue, okay? We had to pay these people every week, every Thursday morning, and it was my job to see that they all got paid. These big machines, you wouldn't believe it. We had to wire boards to read time, you know what a time card is? Put it in the machine and records the time that you came to work, time that you left. And we had people who run around once a week collected all those so we know how many hours you worked and how to pay you for that particular week. This went on week after week after week. So I was pretty good at keeping records and we paid everybody uh, every week 675 people no squawks. So I felt pretty comfortable in what we were doing. We were on the edge of the computer age at the time. Okay, It was shortly after that uh, the computers came in. So that was 34 years at Scott Paper Company. And while I was at Scott, I became involved in politics locally on a, on a state level. I worked part-time uh, in the village. I was a deputy mayor here in the village for six years. I was on the village board. So I had many opportunities to do many nice things and help as many people as I could. And, uh, yeah, well, after I retired in 1981, Jerry Solomon, who happened to be a congressman at the time, knew I knew him well because we had worked together on some political things. He called me to tell me he had heard of my retirement and would I be interested in coming to work for him, like part-time, maybe a day a week or whatever. Biggest lie I ever heard. I wound up being 24-7 with Jerry. I ran his office in Glens Falls for 27 years. I traveled to D.C. and many other parts of the country with Jerry. who was highly thought of in Washington, D.C. And uh, eventually I retired from the federal government. So I retired from Scott Paper Company I retired from the federal government, and I said, now what am I going to do? Oh, I know. In the meantime, Mr. Solomon died on me. Uh, he died uh, six years ago, I guess I was, seven years ago. And uh, Senator Betty Little was a good friend of mine, came to me. She knew I had worked for Jerry, and she said, Dan, I know you like to volunteer, and I'm not offering you a job. But if you want to use my facilities in Glen Squalls, they're all yours. 
Come and go as you please. Do what you want. <clears throat> I know you're interested in Rotary, Chamber of Commerce, and now the Solomon Foundation. The Solomon Foundation had almost a million dollars. Still has almost a million dollars. And I'm the chairman of the foundation. My job is to see that all girls will become gold awards recipients. All Boy Scouts will become Eagle Scouts. All get a certificate plus $500 check. Oh, that's what I've been doing for the last number of years in Betty's office with her authority. Now, so this is how I'm able to use all the equipment over there and do some good throughout the whole community. And that's where I am now. I'm a still a volunteer with Betty Little. I'm over there now pretty much every day. Yeah. Um, looking back, do you see World War II as a defining moment in your life? Do I feel what? Do you feel that World War II was a defining moment in your life? Oh, absolutely. No question about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where this country would be if we hadn't had World War II. We were ahead of it. Uh, you know, nobody knows. It's hard to say. But it was a defining moment. No question about it. The big war. I got to give all the credit in the world to the president because he organized the military, uh, the, the general population of the world, and he brought the country together to win that war, and that's what he did. And uh, the day he died was very sad. He died down there in Warren the Springs, Georgia, and everybody was sad then. The war was over there, but you got to give him credit for ending it. You know. Where were you when that happened? Where was I when FDR died? Yeah. I was on board ship headed toward China. Uh, you know, we knew that you know, the war was over. And uh, we all felt bad about the fact that he, I felt really almost like I lost a real buddy. Because I had seen him so many times, been with him so many times. I knew the guy, knew his family. I could still see his son, Jim, who happened to be a major in the Marine Corps, wheeling his father. Not too many, uh, maybe you know, a lot of people don't know about him being so disabled. He couldn't get out of bed by himself. He couldn't go to the bathroom by himself. He couldn't walk. He had to be served breakfast in bed. And things you didn't know about a president. He was so disabled, and yet his mind was perfect. That's why he was able to make all these great decisions. But the guy was, uh, you know, talk about a defining moment in history. That guy was the reason. Well, well, the, you know, if you ever get a chance to read a book, they call it Pearl Harbor. It tells a story in detail about how disabled this guy really was. People don't know. All they see is a smiling president. That's great. But the story behind it is, is, is a sad story, you know. He had polio. When you see the March of Dimes, who's on that dime? FDR. He founded the March of Dimes. And the word polio is polio virus. That comes from the way he was uh, treated way, way back when he was a young lad, when they determined he had polio. So World War II was definitely a milestone in history. Hope never to be repeated. Um, so you said that you agreed with uh, the decision to use atomic force against Japan. Uh, President Truman. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, did I agree with that? Yes. Absolutely. I, I, got to, I think I thought I told you why. Because uh, that's what I'm going to do my research paper on that it has that goes with this is on the, that decision. You know, you talk so fast it's hard to understand what you're saying. <laughs> you have to slow down a little bit. Um, that's what I'm doing my research paper on that goes with this. What? Uh, the decision to use the atomic bomb. Yeah. That's what I'm oh. doing it on. Oh, that's part of that's part of yours. Yes. Yeah. In my opinion, and I think I, I share, I think everybody shares the same opinion. The people who were in the service at the time, especially, especially those who were headed to Japan, who were going to drop bombs on Japan, who were going to invade Japan, knew that there were going to be millions of people get killed, millions of people, and beyond that, nobody knew what, until Truman made that decision. He authorized, after much painstaking thinking, which probably took about a week, 
I have to drop those two bombs and end this war. Now he knew he was going to kill a lot of people, but they had warning. The Japanese had two warnings. Two days before Hiroshima, all the leaflets came down. We're going to have a deadly bomb and we're going to destroy your cities unless you people, uh, the Hirohito wouldn't have any part of saying yes to that. After the after Hiroshima, they did the same thing. They warned that another terrible weapon was going to be dropped on another Japanese city, Nagasaki. And uh, Hirohito on his white horse, he refused to believe that the Americans would do that again. They did. After that, two days later, Hirohito says, we have to resign. We have to surrender. This war is over. The Americans have made their point. And we've killed the Americans have killed, what, 350,000 people uh, in, with two bombs, and millions have been hurt and maimed by the atomic weapons. So, that's what it was. But it was worth it? You better believe it. Yeah. Um, what do you think was your favorite memory from this time? What was my favorite memory? Yeah. Of what? World War Being II? Being in the service. Oh. Like a happy memory. Yeah. My, fa my favorite memory, of course, I had a lot of them. But the main favorite memory was that December the 24th, 1941, when I shook hands with FDR, Winston Churchill, in less than 30 seconds, two world leaders got together who won the war for the world. For me, that was fantastic. Not too many Marines can say, in fact, not too many people in the world can say that they shook hands with three world leaders in one year. Winston Churchill, FDR, and Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek was the president of China. Six billion people, not million, billion people. That was big, okay? It's very important for the people who, to know. A lot of today's, you know, with, with the fast pace that's going on today, it's very difficult. It can be put in books, and they're all behind me there, about what happened in World War II. But a lot of the today's students don't pay that much attention to history as they should. It's hard. You know, it's hard for a student to sit down and read a book. Let alone you got a you know you got a test coming tomorrow that had nothing to do with World War Two, you know. So it, it takes time and effort, and somebody like me to talk to people and say, hey, you really should concentrate, maybe an hour a month on World War Two. Now these days, you aren't going to be talking about just World War Two. You're talking about Iraq, Afghanistan, Falkland battle, uh, Korea. I get it. Vietnam, those were all wars. So it isn't only World War II. We thought when we wound up that World War II was the last war. Didn't happen that way. You know? So it's important for the young people to learn about history. And in that particular order, okay, we're going to talk about World War II. Well, let's talk, talk about World War I first. World War One was a terrible war. We lost a lot of people, almost as many as we did in World War Two. Civil War, going back, we lost three times as many people in service as they did in uh, Okinawa. So, all our wars were terrible. And but people have to study history in order to get a sense of how tough war is. But it's important. I think that's a good note to end on. Something is up.